professor here at Sydney University working with the Sydney Democracy Network. Uh, I acknowledge that we meet on the ancestral lands of the Gadigal people, and on behalf of us here, I pay my respects to the elders and the Indigenous people of this area. It is a great privilege tonight to welcome David K. Johnston to Sydney University and to, to introduce him to you. David is an investigative journalist, a journalist of 50 years standing. It's a long time in that, uh, in that record. He's an academic also and a prolific author. Author, as many of you will know, of the current bestseller, The Making of Donald Trump. I'd also like to say a special thank you to Professor John Keane and Lindy Baker of the Sydney Democracy Network and also to the rest of the team, Rachel and Janice, who, without whose support this week, uh, this event could not have happened. Uh, John is the inspiration, John Keane, and the architect of the Dark Money Project, which is a venture between Sydney Democracy Network, The Conversation, and michaelwest.com.au, which is my website, which examines corporatocracy, the influence of corporations over government, threat to democracy, and uh, all issues uh, relating to public interest and big business. It's been a real treat uh, this week to hang out with uh, David. And not only uh, is he a very inter interesting character in, in himself, but of course he's known the man who refers to himself as the Donald for 29 years personally. So there's been many good uh, yarns uh, in that. And of course, we also share a common interest in multinational tax avoidance, which is really uh, less arcane than it's meant or designed uh, to, to be. Uh, we also enjoy a common interest in the political influence of large corporations. David's been reporting in Washington and everything from local government in California uh, for decades. And um, journalism, as you all know, is a shrinking business, the mainstream media is shrinking, the revenue is falling 5 or 10% a year. Not a, not a great place to be. Uh, and within that shrinking sector, uh, David and I are part of an even uh, tinier club, which is people who investigate big business uh, and corporations. And um, so it's been a terrific treat, a great experience for me to hang around with them and hear stories uh, this week. I felt like a cadet again, uh, hearing from the, uh, from the editor uh, during our time together. So we've had plenty of laughs. So, David uh, K. Johnson, welcome to Sydney University and away you go. Australia. Uh, I'm the guy Donald Trump said last March nobody ever heard of. <laughs> that was after I got a hold of part of his 2005 tax return, which uh, showed that on an uh, income of $3 million a week, but for a backstop tax in America, he would have paid a tax rate of less than 3.5%, which in America is an important number. The poorest half of Americans pay more than 3.5%. So on um, $300 a week, that's the average income of the bottom half of Americans who file tax returns, they would have been more heavily taxed than not. Um, I want to talk to you about a much broader issue than just Donald though. I want to talk about something I've been thinking about and writing about here and there for you know, 35 years roughly, and that is that I believe Americans in particular, but may well be in some other countries as well. Uh, people are giving up on the idea of democracy and self-government. Uh, right now around the world, we are seeing what I suspect if we could all come back in 500 years, is a large social trend sweeping the world. In America, there is a president now who fosters all sorts of racism and hatred and bigotry, but particularly against Muslims because of a narrow segment of people in the Muslim world who all want to take us back, I would argue, to the ninth century based on their writings. And I'm the kind of guy who, I actually read the Tal the, I'm sorry, the uh, ISIL magazine uh, that they published until very recently, so that I know what they're thinking. 
But we see with the rise of Modi and Hindu nationalism in India, the ultra-Orthodox in Israel, the Christian fundamentalists in America, uh, somewhat in Canada, and perhaps here in Australia, I don't know, a whole movement of people who hold somewhat different views, but who share a fear and an inability to adapt to the enormous explosion of knowledge and information and technology that is remaking the world. When my grandmother, my maternal grandmother, was born in 1890, for all practical purposes, the automobile had not been invented. And in fact, the first time she saw one in Minnesota, it was driving over a frozen lake, and she thought that's what it meant. Instead of being on, on a, a sailboat outfitted with skis for ice boating, that someone invented something that could, on wheels, move across frozen lakes. When my mother was born, or my father was born in 1910, my mother in 1914, there was no radio. When I was born in 1948, as a practical matter, there was no television. When my oldest child was born in 1967, there were no personal computers. We live in a radically different world. The world of today is far more different from the world of 1945 than the world of 1945 was from 1890, and that world was not that much different from way back to Hammurabi's time. And the defining characteristic of our modern world, by the way, on a technological basis, is one thing. Electricity. Everything that's modern is about electricity. Now, the concern I want to address with you about tonight deals with what I believe is a serious attack on democracy that's coming from many, many places. An effort to turn democracy into something else. Now, one of the obvious uh, areas of assault on democracy in the world is Vladimir Putin, who has announced democracy is a joke, and who is brilliantly, brilliantly, on a very tiny budget, because he's running a poor, one note economy country, undermining the democracies of Europe, and the United States, and we're going to find out very soon just how deeply he was involved in putting Donald Trump into the White House. But we're also seeing democracy undermined by people within it. There are new surveys in America that 24% of millennials, my youngest two children are millennials, do not believe in democracy. In America, we have seen for decades fewer and fewer people voting. And with the rise of a change in the economy that led to two income households, we've seen much less participation in civic activity. And listen, I'm, I'm the last guy in the world to say women should not work outside the home and get on. I was writing magazine stories in the 70s about gender pay and equality and how that arose, and my wife's a CEO. Um, but we're also seeing democracy under attack from another sector. And to understand that, I want to take you on a little venture into science fiction for a moment. I want you to imagine somebody comes running through that door right now, shouting, turn on the radio, turn on the radio. And somebody turns on the radio via their cell phone, and we suddenly hear that uh, astronomers have discovered, unseen, that a comet, very unusual comet, is on, heading its way to Earth. It's not going to hit us, it's going to go right by us. But tonight, and for 24 hours, the whole world, they think, is going to be bathed in some odd light show. So as soon as it's dark, we all go outside, we look around, and we go, wow, that's pretty cool. And after a while, we get tired of it, and go inside and go to bed, right? Fast forward 20 years. We notice that one in a thousand among us haven't changed. We haven't aged one bit. The rest of us have gone on. But one in a thousand of us they're frozen in time in terms of their age. And they've undergone a transformation. They only care about making money. They don't care about love, art, beauty. They don't care about sex. They just care about making money. And the other characteristic about them is that they are 100% amoral. They're not immoral. They're not moral. They're amoral. Whatever the rules allow them to do to make money, they will do. Now, if that happened, we would have to change all the laws under which we live that deal with property. And civilization is tied to property in its very early stages. 
Hammurabi's Code, one of the things that I teach in the law school, the graduate business school at Syracuse University, or I did teach for eight years, is full of stuff about property, how to prove this is your property, how to have witnesses, uh, what to do about what today we would call embezzlement. And we would have to unchange our notions of property because if Michael here is one of those people who uh, is the one in a thousand, over time, people like Michael will acquire all the assets they want. The rest of us will slowly own less and less. And the only assets they won't acquire are the ones they don't want to have. Every valuable asset will be in the hands of these one in a thousand immortals. Well, what I've just described to you is a corporation. It's soulless, it's eternal, it's totally money motivated, and it's absolutely amoral. And yet, corporations, which date back in the proto form, far in history, we had trusts under Hammurabi, we had proto corporations in ancient Athens, we had corporations under the Romans. Uh, I, the emperor, appoint you to be pro council. Uh, and to go with the generals to defeat the Germanics. And in the 20 years I expect you'll be gone, we will appoint you to run your estate and take care of it. If you lose the agency, you can't sell it, you can't do a lot of things, you just manage it. But those were proto corporations. They created corporations to hold municipal property. If you go to Rome, you'll notice the signs as you enter the city say, Commune de Rome. And they say the exact same thing in Stockholm, except it says Commune of Stockholm. These artificial persons that can hold property and manage property and create wealth are incredibly valuable and useful. I'm not here to argue we shouldn't have corporations, all right? But we have to have rules that govern them. They are not people, as Mitt Romney said when he was running for president of the United States back in a few years ago. They are not people. They are persons, and we have to have rules so that we get the benefits of corporations and we don't get the losses. Now, one of the burdens of being a person is that you have to share in the costs and the difficulties and the needs of being a corporation, of being a society. Hold on, I forget to put my timer on because there's no clock here. Everybody in this room pays taxes. Even if you're so poor that you don't qualify for paying income taxes, you pay taxes. There's the GST, there's uh, embedded excise taxes, there are fuel taxes, there are all sorts of taxes you pay. If it's a monopoly, you effectively pay their taxes because the only way the monopoly can be taxed by the government is to get the money from its customers. And we are beginning to see a world in which corporations have figured out not just how to shirk the duty of paying corporations, which Michael West here has done a brilliant job of doing. Incredibly brilliant job. I've been reading his work from America. I don't know why this is enormous news here, the work that he's done. But we're now finding corporations literally make a profit off the income tax system that burdens you. Now, how do you do that? Well, in America, it works this way, and I first exposed this when I was writing about Enron, beginning of this century. You take the swoosh for Nike shoes, the H for Hilton Hotels, the secret process for making Viagra pills, and you sell it to a foreign entity, to another corporation that's your own. You got my bill? So I get, oh no, you don't have a bill, just this is, I've got a bill, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm buying, I'm buying here, here we go, all right. So what you do is you take a dollar you made of profit in the United States, you can do this in Australia, and you pay it to your foreign subsidiary. It's exactly the same thing if I took this out of my right pocket, put it in my left pocket, and I got a tax deduction. 
And then it gets better. Unless there are rules against it, you borrow it back. And then the profits you make off that, you take it out of this pocket, you send it to Singapore or Bermuda or the Cayman Islands or Grenada. It depends on your particular circumstances, which country you want to use, and you put it over here. And you know what you get? Another tax deduction. Now, there is something called the time value of money. It's what rich people understand. It's what tax lawyers understand. If, if any of you won the Powerball tomorrow, and you suddenly have, I don't know what it is here, but let's assume it's a billion dollars for simplicity. And you go to your, your you go to a tax lawyer and say, I suddenly have a billion dollars. What do I do? The lawyer says, good for you, you never have to pay income taxes again. What? Once you pay the taxes on a billion dollars, you can live tax free. We're going to buy you a diversified portfolio of assets, stocks that don't pay dividends, and bonds that are tax free. I don't know if you have those here, but in America we have tax exempt bonds. And you, when you need money, you just borrow against your assets. So let's say you want to spend $10 million. You want to have fun. Go home, especially if you're married, sit down, try to figure out how to spend $10 million a year in your lifestyle. Now, if you buy a house, that's not spending. That's just investing in real estate. You want to buy an oil painting? That's an investment. I mean, consume the money. Spend the money so it's gone. You'll find out it's really, really hard to do. I'll give you one conceit of how to make the price go. You don't want to buy a jet, you want to lease one. <laughs> so, now you've got this money that you didn't pay taxes on. You know what that money represents? It's an interest-free loan from the government. If all the money you paid in income taxes in the current year, you got to keep at the end of the year, same time you buy you would have an interest-free loan from the government equal to taxes you didn't pay. Anybody here object to getting interest-free income from so interest-free loans? I mean, anybody in their right mind is going to get every interest-free loan they can possibly lay their hands on. Well, if you only earn 4% and you reinvest the money, in 34 years, you can pay the government the taxes that you deferred. You can give them this coin that you have here, and it's gone, and you can put, depending on your return, 4%, $2, a little higher return, $5 in your pocket. You will be richer because of the income taxes. You don't get to do that. But the multinationals do. Google gets to do that. Apple gets to do that. Apple right now has over a quarter of a trillion dollars in interest-free loans from governments offshore. Because Apple is a company that, well, you might think it's in Cupertino, California. You might know that its research arm is owned in Ireland. It is, as one of their executives testified under oath to the United States Senate, tax resident nowhere. And nowhere has no legislature, and therefore, no taxes. It's a great place to be, except it means you pay more than those folks. Now, if everybody owned a share of Apple, wouldn't be such a big deal. But wealth is unbelievably highly concentrated in the world, and it's far more highly concentrated now than it was 30 and 40 years ago. Perhaps not as concentrated as it's been in times of history. But in, since World War II, the concentration of wealth in the world, especially since the early 1980s, has become much, much, much greater. And once you have a surplus, more money than you can spend, it snowballs. Think of a man who gets a job when he's young, hauling sacks of grain from one place to another. He saves his money and he buys a donkey. Now I can haul more sacks of grain, save more money, then he can buy a cart. Saves a little bit more money, he can buy a truck. Eventually he can build a one-man railroad. And I don't know about your country, but in my country there are several hundred one- or two-person railroads that just run a short haul, maybe a mile or two from a factory to a, a larger line. And what's happening is the work is being performed more and more by capital. Capital is doing the labor. Again, I'm not arguing against 
corporations or against capital. I'm just trying to explain how the system works. So what do we do in modern societies? We tax capital at a lower rate than labor. Now, in the 1920s, Andrew Mellon, the scion of a rich American family in Pittsburgh that owned an oil company and owned banks, and a guy who was personally quite corrupt. If you want to see how corrupt, watch the uh, HBO series Boardwalk Empire about the bank city. Andrew Mellon wrote a book about taxes. And in that book, he said that capital should be more highly taxed than labor. And the reason he said was that you have a limited life to work. An injury or sickness can take away your ability to work. And you have to save from those earnings enough money to sustain yourself in old age. Or as Lord King said, there is no escaping for society the costs of old age. But if you have capital, it keeps earning. And you can pass it on to your heir. Therefore, we should tax it more heavily. Today, we the exact opposite. There are economists all over the place, including people from the Chicago School. And I went to the University of Chicago Graduate School of Economics, although I'm known as an apostate of that school, <laughs> who argue that the tax on capital gains should be zero. If you want to get the maximum possible money put into investments to have capital gains, then the tax rate should be zero. And I agree. And the same would apply to work. If you want to be a lord, more, tax them at zero. The problem is you can't have a civilized society without taxes. Taxes are civilization. In 1793, Edmund Burke, the British jurist, historian, and philosopher, started modern conservatism with a letter you can go read on the internet, in which he said, the revenue of the state is the state. A government is its taxes. Now, I live in a country that is in its second form, the second American Republic. We don't teach that to students. Even my third year law students, when I tell them that, they're like, what? But America began with something called the Articles of Confederation Government. And it failed very quickly because it had no power to tax. The central government could only go to the states and beg for money, please, please, please. We, we need to have soldiers, the British are coming, please, money. <laughs> and had no power to regulate commerce. So Connecticut would impose rules against New York, and New York against Connecticut, and you got to have those trade wars. So we had a silent coup d'etat. People gathered in Annapolis to discuss how to get a new constitution. And the actual issue that they gathered for in Annapolis, what gave America its constitution that it operates under today, was mud in the Delaware River. Pennsylvania, which to this day is a retrograde state, could not reach an agreement with New Jersey or Delaware or Maryland on what to do about shifting sandbars that all rivers have and what to do about the rules of navigation. Maryland and Virginia settled their dispute like that. Mud in the, in the Delaware River is what led to the Constitution of the United States of America. And the next year after the meeting in Annapolis, they had a constitutional convention and they wrote this new document. It was designed to be conservative, make it hard to change, and yet durable. And they did a pretty good job, 232 years. <coughs> Today, that democracy, like many in the world, is in very deep trouble. Because people are not paying attention. And they're not doing so for a number of reasons. One of them I mentioned the two-income family that has taken away time from raising children, from coupling, and from community service, from being involved and engaged and having time. We've had another problem. The rise of what I call commercial sports. <clears throat> you know, baseball, soccer, football, they're all fun, but they're not serious. They're just entertainment and yet they consume the lives of many people. And when I've gone to blue-collar bars in Ohio and Michigan and New Jersey and just people don't know who I am and I dress like the people there and I sit down and order a beer and get them into a conversation, I hear the following things. Politics is all corrupt. Don't want anything to do with it. Don't want anything to do with that stuff. I have no influence. I'm a nobody. I can't affect anything. You can't beat City Hall or Washington. 
It doesn't matter what I want to do. Oh, hey, look at that flight. Did you see him getting out of second base? And, and these people aren't stupid. If some interesting play comes, their ability to dissect and analyze how the play went down is extraordinary. Because those are things that have become important to their lives. Likewise, we have advertising designed to get us to think about things other than being citizens. Now, when I arrived on Monday, and Michael drove me to the hotel I was staying at, I did the thing I always do when I arrive in another country. I do two things. This one, I'm not going to do one because I don't have time. Normally, I get a cab driver and say, take me to the poorest neighborhood. Now, if you're in Mexico or Tegucigalpa or Cairo, the neighborhood you can take to isn't really the poorest, but it's pretty poor, and you can see how bad it is. But the other thing I always do is I turn on the TV to watch the ads. You can learn a lot about the culture from the ads. And the first ad that I saw when I sat down looked like a Game of Thrones. Those of you who watch Game of Thrones know in the opening sequences, they show you the different kingdoms, and one of them is called Bravos, where the Iron Bank is. And all the would-be dictators and kings and other dragons, they're all very cautious about the Iron Bank. And there's a gigantic statue of a soldier over the harbor standing guard with his shield and his sword. And there's a chute and a coin is rolling down into the banker's vaults. Well, you know what Adam was talking about from the Australian Taxation Authority? It shows this wooden chute like it was made out of Legos with coins rolling across Australia, and then it says, we've collected $1.5 billion. This is the man, if anybody else deserves credit for it, who's responsible for it. Michael West, by making it an issue. By saying, hey, you're getting ripped off, folks. But this ad was not journalism. Journalism is the only business where you get paid to tell the truth. And your doctor comes to you and says, listen, I'm sorry, you got six weeks left. He's telling you the truth, but that's not what he's getting paid to do. He's getting paid to diagnose you. Journalists are the only people whose duty and job is to tell the truth. Doesn't mean we're perfect, doesn't mean we always do it, but that's the job. Advertising is to create desires and wants and needs and distract you from things. And so this ad says $1.5 billion. Well, no number has meaning without relationship to another number. If any of you have either read Douglas Adams' book, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, or seen the movie, you know that the answer to everything, life and the meaning of the universe, is 42. And for those of you who didn't, don't worry, I didn't wrote a movie on the for <laughs> Now, there's actually a hidden little joke about computer programming in 42, but essentially it's meaningless. I mean, what if I suddenly said, I'm here to talk about 27? 27 what? 27% of companies cheat on their taxes. Uh, my youngest child is 27 years old. Uh, what, what, 27 what? Even the weather, where you may only hear one number, it's going to be 20 degrees today, centigrade, you know from experience what that means. You know relatively what that means compared to 30 or 10. Numbers only have meaning in relation to the numbers. So the number I want to see is, 1.5 billion. Is that 100% of what they should have paid? Or is it a penny on the dollar? I don't know. Because they didn't tell me. And in that ad, the Australian Taxation Authority has adopted the techniques of the company it is supposed to regulate. It has given you the part of the story it wants you to hear. It has not told you anything about the set of facts you need to judge its competency, its diligence, and whether it has been allowed to do its job. And what is the job of every tax authority? It's policing. In America, we have something called the Food and Drug Administration. They are the pharmaceutical police. We have something called the Securities and Exchange Commission. They are the Wall Street police. We have the control of the currency. That's the banking police. And we have the Internal Revenue Service. Those are the tax police. And yet, what do you hear politicians do all the time? They run against the tax authorities. They attack the tax authorities. And in this case, they spend your tax dollars to do an ad about how great they are without any way for you to judge whether they did a great job or not. $1.5 I don't know. 
Is it, is it a big share or is it a little share? They didn't tell you. Well, this goes to a fundamental problem that is vexing modern societies. And that problem is the rise of a set of values that corporations want to have, want to have instilled in you because it's what benefits them. Martin Luther King, the civil rights leader, in his 1963 speech said that he hoped his four young children would someday live in a world where they would be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And what we've created in America is a society where now you are judged by the contents of your wallet, or in the case of Donald Trump, the presumed contents of your wallet. <laughs> the notion that there is some connection between wealth and character is absurd if you just think about it for two seconds. And yet, Donald Trump ran for office saying, I'm worth, and this isn't a matter, by the way, of a couple of weeks, $8.7 billion, $10 billion, more than $10 billion. I'm worth more than $11 billion. Nothing, of course, in the stock market caused numbers to change like that. Nothing in the real estate market, because Donald just makes it up. And by the way, this spring, when he had to uh, file his financial disclosure, technically he didn't have to file it, but as a political matter, he did. Uh, they first asked if he could file it without signing it. Because when you sign it, you have to do what's called a jurat. That is, a jurat is whenever you sign a government document under penalty of perjury. You have to tell the truth or you can prosecute you. But he finally signed it, he filed it. You know how much it said he was worth? $1.4 billion. Nowhere near what he's ran for office for. And you know, almost nobody reported that. I reported in my news service. I mentioned it on TV, but I didn't see it on the front page of the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, anywhere else. The yeah, campaign succeeded. In fact, the day before I left for here, I watched correspondents standing in front of the White House from two different American television networks refer to Donald Trump and his $10 billion fortune. Advertising gets you to think about what the advertisers want you to think about. And the Australian tax authorities want you to think that the problem of multinational corporation tax avoidance in your country has been eliminated. Well, it hasn't. It hasn't been eliminated anywhere. But you know what? It could be. It's an entirely solvable problem. All the law enforcement in the world will not stop intimate murders. That is, somebody comes home and sees their spouse in bed with somebody else and loses it and stabs them or shoots them. Law enforcement can't stop that. But law enforcement can stop commercial murders, putting out a contract on somebody so they don't testify against you in a trial, or so you can collect insurance on them. We can stop that and reduce it a lot. We can reduce access to guns. In America, we have more guns than people. And a growing number of military-grade weapons I, by the way, think that uh, if you want to be a literalist about the American Constitution, Second Amendment, which says uh, people have a right to bear arms, it also doesn't say guns, it says arms. I want a personal nuclear weapon because nobody's going to mess with me, let me tell you. But carry it on my backpack everywhere. <laughs> All of these factors come together in how Donald Trump became president. And I played a role in this unintentionally. I wrote a series of books, partly while I was at the New York Times, partly after I left, on what had happened to the American economy. How could it be that 90% of Americans' incomes were flat? And in fact, if you look at jobs, their wages were down. And a very small group of people were doing well. And let me illustrate to you just how much that change has taken place. In America, we get a report every year on the 400 biggest numbers on tax returns. Now that's not the 400 highest incomes. It's the 400 highest incomes Congress requires to be reported. If you're a hedge fund manager and you made $4 billion debt one year and $5 billion the next, as one of the hedge fund managers did, and the number of them make a billion dollars a year, or did until very recently, they don't have to report those incomes. They're allowed, just like the multinational corporations, to defer them in the future to get an interest-free loan from the government. So I want you to think for a moment about 1961. How many of you were not alive in 1961? 
Very good numbers. Well, in 1961, your parents, for those of you who are younger, if they were working in America, had an after tax income that we're going to call one dollar. And in that 2013, more than a half century later, when you adjust for inflation, for every dollar they had back there, they had a dollar and 25 cents after taxes. That's not much growth. That's a half a penny a year for 52 years. And in fact, that would be a dollar 26. So it's less than a half a penny a year. Now, in dollars, it's about 5,500 bucks. And we can fill this shoebox with 5,500 bucks. All right? So just imagine this is. Your income over 52 years later, how much increase did you get in the last year? $5,200. We'll put it right here. It's a foot high. How did the 400 do? Well, we wouldn't know except for an anomaly that I found in these statistics published by the American tax agents and the IRS that there were 398 people who made over a million dollars in 1961. 398, 400, statistically insignificant. So I computed all the numbers. The 400 top tax returns, they obviously had more boxes, right? Their boxes that go over my head, go through the ceiling, and go through the roof. Seven miles. 35,200 boxes to one. Oh, there's another element I haven't told you about. These folks, they are paying one penny more per dollar in federal income and social security taxes now than they paid in 1961. And these folks over here, 20 cents less per dollar. No wonder they're so rich. Just the savings alone from 20 cents per dollar would make them rich. We literally have in America his and her couples who own their own jumbo jets. We have one couple I've written about where one of their set personal 747s is equipped for skateboarding in the sky by their youngest heirs. So when the pilot's flying, he can do this. And they can ride fly with their skateboard in an open area with little lifts and things to have fun. And tomorrow, the Republicans in Congress in the United States will introduce a bill. They will call the middle class tax cut. They will call it the biggest middle class tax cut in all history. And we don't know the exact wording of it, but don't be surprised if it turns out that 67% of the benefits, certainly more than half the benefits, go to the 1%. Now, when I began this talk, I talked about one in a thousand. I cited Michael West as my example, and there's a reason I did one in a thousand. In America, at least where I live, 1% starts at about $400,000 a year of taxable income. That's about $600,000 of total income. It's a lot of money. But it's overwhelmingly two income couples, a lawyer married to a doctor, a best-selling author married to a, the head of a half-billion-dollar charity, an accountant, a partnership accountant married to a dean of the law school. That's who's making the money. These are people who go to work every day. It's when you get to the one in a thousand level, which starts at about $2 million, that things change. And what happens in America is America has a progressive tax system in that as incomes rise, you pay a larger share of the government until you get to about $2 million when it flattens out, and then you get to $10 million and it falls. And if you can get to enough income that the growth of your income exceeds your annual consumption, that billion dollars, paying income taxes becomes voluntary. Because you can just buy a portfolio that isn't have taxable income and borrow against the money, and you will get richer and richer and richer. At the same time, that that's going on, we have people like Donald. <clears throat> Donald Trump is widely regarded as a very successful businessman. He's not. He's a terrible businessman. He's a terrible negotiator, too. I've negotiated with him many times, and he's always manipulated. It's hilarious. <laughs> When he was in Atlantic City, he didn't have one dollar invested ever in Atlantic City. First casino he built, all fees and borrowed money. Second casino, he borrowed the full price of it, took a five million dollar fee off the top for himself. 
Third casino, same thing. Took the feet off the top for himself. Negative investment in everything. And of course, if you have a negative investment in the business, your rate of return is infinite. The owners of the Holiday Inn's chain that's all over the world, they had a serious discussion, which I wrote about in my first book 25 years ago, about leasing everything. The chairs, the executives sat in. They were going to lease them. So that the only asset they had was the cash in the bank to meet cash flow needs because their rate of return on investment would go through the roof. And that's what you're seeing all sorts of companies do. And yet to the tax authorities, they appear to be impoverished. Now, there's an underlying problem I want to end with about this. Donald Trump is the symptom, not the disease, of what's happening. He is the symptom. He is a corrupt, incompetent, deranged criminal. If you read my book, everything of which it comes from the public record, all sorts of things I know about Donald, I didn't put it in because I didn't want anybody to be able to challenge the fact. My email's in the book, it's in 11 languages all over the world. Nobody has shown a single error, which is also true of my earlier books. Donald Trump was involved in an international drug trafficker up to his eyeballs. I point out in the book that I can't explain what the things he did that I described, the letter he wrote, the actions he took. But I know the question to ask, which could provide the answer, because everything he did makes 100% logical sense if he was financing the drug trade. Can't prove he did it, but I certainly know that's the question to ask. What's happening that I'm concerned about is that money, wealth, this idea that the content of your wallets are what matter, that the wealth of your corporation is what matters more than anything, is distorting our human values. The man who framed the Constitution of the United States, the framers, Madison, Monroe, Paranoid John Adams, they all wrote about what they thought would happen in the future of America, and they wrote that what they feared would someday destroy this radical idea of self-government that they had pursued was not a foreign power. It wasn't an invading army. It wasn't internal factions. It wasn't even those who mentioned it in some way the Civil War that brought about the end of this horrible institution of slavery and cost the life of 2% of everybody in the country, including about 40,000 black Americans. It was extreme inequality. They wrote about their concerns that a business aristocracy would arise. That's my term, not theirs. But a business aristocracy would arise. And if people did not own the land and farm it themselves or own the tools they worked with, that is, if they did not have property, they would have no understanding of property, and these business aristocrats would persuade them to vote for laws, telling them, this is good for you. You'll be better off if you do this. We're going to drain the swamp. When, in fact, these laws were inimical to the interests of these people. Well, we don't have millions and millions of people in America. They don't have any property. If they have a house, it's mortgage to the hilt. The average income of the bottom half of Americans is less than $40,000 a year. You can drive through towns in the Midwest where the largest business is making and selling meth and find people tweaking all over town. It's scary to go into these towns. You find decay and things falling apart. And many of these people voted for Donald. Because Donald said, I'm your savior. I am the only person who can solve your problems. And he described the things I had described in my series of books, which I know Donald didn't read them, but he watched me on TV. He captured what was in them. I mean, in some ways, I'm responsible. It's a great irony. I'm responsible for the guy. <coughs> and as long as surviving journalist who doesn't print as truth is nonsense. But all around the world, these values, what matters is the measure of your wealth and your income, are working to undermine democracy and freedom and liberty. Robert Mercer, the hedge fund manager who put the money into Trump that allowed him to target their campaign, says the value of human beings is entirely the basis of their money. 
and that most human beings have no value at all. In fact, he has said his cats are more valuable than most people, because at least his cats, when they purr, give him pleasure, and that helps him earn more money. These are horrible values. Absolutely horrible in that they're taking hold, and advertising is promoting them. And underneath all of this is a tax system that is being starved, so that we don't properly educate children, we don't teach them classics, we don't teach them virtues, we don't teach them critical thinking skills. But I'll tell you, at least in America, we got football. <laughs> we don't have students reading novels. In fact, in the school district in the town where I live, not the suburb I live in, but the central city, there are English teachers who say to students, see all those novels behind the lock glass cabinets? Those are not for you. I'm going to show you who because the teacher is holding the students in contempt. He thinks they can't read and understand. If you don't read novels, you don't learn narrative, you don't learn about the other, and you become further prey to those who see the artificial person, the corporation, and the other entities as the way to achieve their goals, as if that comet was real. I have one answer for you. You want to maintain democracy? Next time you go to a talk like this, bring somebody who's young. Talk to your grandchildren. Tell politicians that if they serve the companies and put their interests ahead of yours, if they think artificial people are more important than real people, you're going to organize people to get them out of office. And taxes are democracy. They are the core of our democracy. They are the foundation on which we build our wealth and we have our liberty. And if you undermine that, if you pound it in the sand, then when the inevitable social storms come along, you will see your wealth fall over and you will see your liberties washed away. Much as none of us want to pay taxes, taxes are civilization. They are the foundation of everything we hold dear. And if we don't learn to appreciate them, we will lose all the things you get because of them. Thank you. Start me with a fee. Right. 
Uh, what have you done uh, about the Business Council of Australia? And this is one example. This is a good example, but there are many, and I see multinational corporations that all the time, many infringements. There are penalties in the laws that could be imposed. And my question is, and I know that's happening in America too, it's not just a matter of the rules, it's a matter of the culture right. and the enforcement. You know, if you read Soviet law, which I've done a little bit of, uh, <laughs> It's actually very well written law. Um, Taken to a law professor and haven't analyzed it. Wow, that's yeah, that's quite well written. And of course, the Soviet system was totally and completely corrupt. You were guilty the moment the state decided it wanted to execute you or send you to do law. So rules are one step in the process. The next one is you have to have a culture of enforcement. And all laws have to have a mercy clause. You have to have, you know, there's a circumstance where you, you can't anticipate all circumstances. So you have to have a clause that's an escape clause when there would be an injustice done. But if the culture is, uh, as Scott Pruitt, the head of the American Environmental Protection Agency under Trump, said when he introduced himself by video to all the staff, uh, for he went on for 25 minutes, and all he talked about was the duty they had to serve the polluters. He didn't talk about wildlife, he didn't talk about fish, he didn't talk about human health or children not getting asthma. It was entirely about how to take care of the industries. And culture matters, and that grows out of norms. Uh, uh, in America, the people on the right often like to say, uh, you can't legislate morality. Well, there was a time when if you were a white man in the South, you could kill a black man with impunity. Not anymore. Not anymore. Not perfect, but that's not true anymore. And in fact, we can legislate around. And we legislate all the time in various things that we do. And those reflect popular culture and popular will. So you have to have a society that says fairness is a value that matters. And in a democracy, fairness is very, very important. In an autocracy, off of your head. Uh, question? Um, the system you've described, isn't it really spelling its own doom? Because the, sorry, the system you've described, isn't it really, really leading to its own doom? Because incomes are falling. Businesses in Australia are getting very worried now because people aren't spending. Right. So if they're not spending, there's going to be very little wealth creation than it used to be. Right. Well, one of the great ironies of this is each corporation has an interest only in its own welfare. Um, if average incomes were rising, corporations would make more money. But because of the narrow interest in the way we define things, they don't have this broad interest. That's why we have to have other mechanisms to overcome that and to control that. And taxes are one of the ways to deal with that. Um, uh, I'm actually, a, my, my, I have a book coming out, another book coming out on Trump in January, but the book I'm working on now that I set aside and I hope will be out in the year is I have created an entirely new tax system for modern countries where you can't cheat and it addresses these issues. Um, well, we'll see if it works. I mean, the professors have said it works. We'll see when it gets published. I mean, people are going to have a laughing stock. Who knows? But, um, Yes, we're seeing democracy do itself in because capitalism is, right now, the best system we've come up with, okay? But just as in the Star trek world of the future, if it turns out that we have more resources than we need, and you can walk up to a machine and say, tea, Earl Grey, hot, and it knows what kind of cup you want, how strong the tea is, then it won't matter. So we have to get the rules right, we have to enforce the rules, and we have to see to it that people are properly compensated for their services. And, you know, Pope Francis has the answer to that. There is no economic justice without unions. And I say that, by the way, as well, somebody who's been the head of the union and the founder of a successful corporation. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the evidence of Trump being impeached before the end of his first term? Yeah. You know, Richard Nixon faced uh, a Congress in which both the House and Senate were run by Democrats. And even they took two years to remove him. And Richard Nixon was a criminal. I mean, first of all, the vice president admitted he was a criminal and resigned. And while Nixon did not go to prison, uh, his tax lawyer did go to prison. 
because he was a colonel. He was a colonel act. Um, so long as the Republicans control Congress, there is no chance that Trump will be uh, impeached absent him doing something really crazy. And I predicted Donald would become more and more erratic, as he has been, because he doesn't know anything. I mean, he literally doesn't know anything. Thanks to the world's greatest expert on 21 different subjects. I know a little about tax, and I tried to give him tax advice once, and it was pretty simple, he couldn't follow it. One of his professors, you know, once said he was the, pardon my language, the goddamn dumbest student I ever had in my life. <laughs> um, uh, there's a lot of fun being made of one of his sons today, who doesn't know that you um, a median and mean. Uh, a lot of people don't, but if you're going to lecture people uh, about it, you ought to know what you're talking about. If Donald was something really crazy, they might impeach him. But if the Democrats get control of the House, they'll impeach him. Then the question is, can they convict him in the Senate? And then two other questions arise. If Donald were to be impeached and convicted and removed from office, if that's the end of it, he will spend the rest of his life going around America promoting violence and revolution because that's who he is. He is about Donald. And he believes he is the superior human being, but of course he should be president. And he will be unconstrained. So if they're going to do that, I think they have to also plan to criminally prosecute him, convict him, and send him to prison where he has belonged for many, many years. <laughs> There's a second problem. If they impeach and remove him because Vladimir Putin interfered in the election, does Mike Pence have to go too, the vice president? And Mike Pence, who's not electable, I don't think there's any chance he's electable. If he does get forced out as a result of that because he's the beneficiary of the very same acts, then the Democrats have to run against Paul Ryan, who is an extreme right-winger who practices what I call Paul Ryan math. That is, you stand up the side of the numbers you care about and ignore the other side of the ledger. And he said it would be a formidable candidate. So there is no good ending to this. <laughs> so just uh, taking into account what you said about our ATO and its self-congratulation about how much uh, tax is collected. That you're paying for it. Yeah. A according to the IRS, tax evasion cost $3.4 trillion between 2001 and 2010. It says that 18 to 19%. Yeah. About a billion dollars a day. I'm just wondering, do you think that they're correct about that figure or are they lowballing it? They are very much lowballing that. One of the reasons we don't have the money for the services we need is that we've set up, and this is part of the new tax system that I call the prosperity tax, and I hope we sell it in Australia, uh, does, is um, if you're a business owner, I'm a business owner, two businesses, um, I can take money out of it without any checks unless I'm audited. But if you're an employee, you can't get your paycheck until the money's taken out ahead of time. And if you're very wealthy, you can borrow against the money and not pay taxes. And we can fix all that. We just have to change the rules. I think the tax evasion, the tax evasion is higher than the billion dollars a day. And tax avoidance that we shouldn't allow, like taking the money out of your right pocket and putting it in the left, and yes, I'll give you your, your sick <laughs> um, is also larger than that. And by the way, the IRS every year comes out with a report that varies by about 2%. That tells you right there that that's nonsense. Somebody way over here, maybe? You would know that side of the room. Yeah, Jeff. Um, I assume you are a Democrat, so. Uh, no, I'm actually a registered Republican. No, I, I just wonder, uh, saying. Uh, uh, what would you prefer, uh, Hillary or Bernie? Uh, and can you tell me why? Sure. Um, but I'm a registered Republican. I have been for a long time. Um, so we should believe the opposite of what you said. <laughs> well, uh, there are other, I mean, I'm not a partisan person. I register as Republican because one of the things that's a lot setting, but frankly, where I live, there's no point in registering as a Democrat. <laughs> but I also believe that government ought to, uh, you know, we ought to have the most a, a government that is as small as possible, and one of the things I teach are regulations that are self-reinforcing the virtues so government doesn't have to involve itself too much in the economy. Um, and Bernie saying, I know both, I, I know Bernie, I know Bernie and Donald, I don't know Hillary. Hillary tried to get me fired at the New York Times, that's all I know about Hillary. My <laughs> wife, my wife is Hillary, she's part of what's called the Wellesley Mafia. Um, 
Uh, Bernie Sanders has never accomplished anything in his life. He horribly mistreats his staff. He has done his whole life. Uh, people who worked their hearts out for him in campaigns were not hired to go with him when he got hired. He's never passed a bill. He has a, a record of no accomplishment whatsoever. But man, can that guy rouse a crowd. So, you know, the Democrats need to come up with a 50-year-old Bernie who's actually done something, been a mayor, run a business, uh, been a military officer, I don't know, something. Uh, Hillary Clinton would have been an okay president. She would have been the children's president. The number one thing that would have happened with her is there would have been a huge focus on children and marriage and those issues in America. Uh, there's, a big, there's a debate going on, not as big as I would like to see, about whether it is marriage that makes for sound economics, as the people on the right say, or sound economics that makes for good marriages. The most enduring marriages in America are all in the blue states. The least enduring and serial marriages tend to be in the red states. Um, she would have been hawkish. Um, she would have been Vladimir Putin, Putin's worst nightmare. And she would not have, as Donald has done, been an enormous unintended aid to the Beijing government's efforts to be the dominant power in the Pacific. I was one of the leading critics in America of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, not but, but for reasons dealing with monopolies and corporate power and division of people. I understood that it was also designed to contain the ambitions of the Chinese. Now, Australia would be part of the 16-nation uh, regional comprehensive economic plan. And if that comes together and works, uh, it will show the brilliance of Xi, who basically, has, what has diplomats been saying to Canberra and Santiago and everywhere else? Why are you looking at America? We're the country of the future. They have this doofus in the White House. They give it to us. <laughs> and, but Americans don't want it because it's a good report. I mean, you, you can find it if you really look for it. If you find it the way my former newspaper, the New York Times, reports it, or if you've got college education, you can figure it out. But ordinary people do not look at it. There was somebody right below you. Ah, oh, there we go. Hi, David. Thanks for a lovely talk. Uh, have you given any thought to artificial intelligence and how it might affect the middle class? Artificial intelligence. Well, yeah. sure. And the impact on income and <laughs> inequality? Yeah. When I was in high school in the 60s, the first half of the 60s, uh, one of the big topics for high school students was uh, automation, job destroyer or job creator. And the, the overwhelming opinion of the futurist back then was that by the year 2000, we would be so wealthy in America that people would have 28 hour work weeks and more money than they knew what to do with, and idle hands being the devil's workshop would be the biggest social problem we would. Well, I can see how well that works. <laughs> um, oh, uh, industrial jobs are created by inefficiency. When people in India first made steel more than, I guess, about 3,000 years ago, uh, you know, guys with big muscles pounded charcoal into iron, and to make a, a ton of steel took years to make one ton. Uh, tribute to by English nations uh, uh, when. Alexander the Great conquered some countries. He demanded tribute to be paid in steel. You want diamonds or gold, you wanted steel. And now it takes 40 minutes of labor to produce a ton of steel. Uh, industrial jobs are not coming back. Much more mental intensive jobs are coming back. So it's a simple problem. What do we do about the people who don't have the mental capacity to do these kinds of jobs? Um, and, and we have to figure out how to address that. There is a, a, a movement in the United States, this tiny, promoted by one of my colleagues at Syracuse Law, uh, with a terrible name of binary, uh, binary economics. But it is the idea that everybody should be a capitalist, and the part of your pay should be a capital, and the earnings of capital should earn more capital. So we all have a There's a lot of discussion of a basic universal income, and where it's been tried in India and some other places, a basic universal income has not have the effect of, hey, let's go smoke dope and drink beer, but oh, now we can accomplish something, we can do something. People, some people go smoke dope, but that's not the norm. Um, India has also experimented with a system where in some, I'm sorry, a cultural problem, I think they're called provinces, some regions of the country, local government, uh, governments at what we would call the state level, 
um, you are entitled to a job from the government for 100 days a year. And given that people generally work 240 or 250 days a year, it's a half an income. And it has had the effect of pushing up incomes for other things. We're going to see, I suspect, in the future, because of artificial intelligence, new services, different services. Uh, we're going to see concentration of wealth if we don't address it. But the even bigger change than that that's coming is in biology. Um, my grandchildren, some of whom are already grown grandchildren, will almost certainly be able to go down to a store one day called Designer Jeans <laughs> and say, well, we want a child and a girl who has dad's hair color and you know, mom's legs and pretty soon there'll be a child born with a foot growing out of their head. That's a regulatory problem. But, but the biological revolution that's coming is going to completely remake the world. We're going to have legless pigs and salmon that grow to full size in 13 weeks, and uh, it's really going to change the world. Uh, I wondered if you'd reconsider your view about increasing equality. You suggested that we need to depend on unions, but they haven't succeeded. But, they, but the real source of the inequality you're talking about is property rights. I think you've mentioned that. And surely the answer is to re-change the nature of property rights so that no investment property has a life longer than an intellectual property and patents, which is 20 years. And um, because otherwise, people get, in, investors get overpaid in a way that accountants do not report, economists do not see, right. politicians don't know about, except people like Kelso, who are born to Australia in right. 1975, and Motorball called Democratizing the Wealth of Nations based on the... Uh, I know about Louis Kelso, that's binary accounts. No, yes, I'm talking about something different from binary talking about universal capitalism. No, I understand that. He believed everybody should... When I was 10 years old, I read about Louis Gelsow. It was completely fascinating by him. Got me on the path that I'm on in some ways. The, 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 first of all, I don't think... Gelsow didn't want to change property rights. He wanted to maintain them. That's right. He wanted to rob the ownership of property. And, so, I, and first I of all... I want to limit it. Like, all intellectual bodies have limited life, and that's what we should do. Right? Understood. 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 First of all, I don't agree with you about unions. I think that... Um, unions have been very successful in many ways, but they have decks stacked against them. There are good unions and there are bad unions, but as I tell audiences in America, no union ever went out with machine guns and killed women and children in tents, which is what the Rockefellers did in Colorado in 1905. Uh, no union ever hired um, a bunch of thugs to go attack children, as happened in Michigan in the 1930s, when the UAW was organized. That, but there are unions that have done lots of bad things. Corporations do them too. Uh, but if workers should have a right of association to negotiate their pay, because almost all people are a commodity. If you're a secretary, you can be replaced by another secretary. There's a handful of people that have peculiar talents who can earn enormous amounts of money. I'm sort of in that group. I can negotiate on my own. People come to me, I don't have to go to them for work. So I have a little bit of appreciation of that. But I think unions, in fact, have been very important so that we have some equality. As to the second issue, yeah, I think we need to have a fundamental discussion about the nature of property and our historic rules about property. And I don't know, I've heard this idea of limited ownership of uh, real estate, uh, there are issues about land rents and how they're done, but we really need to have a serious debate about the nature of property. And it's, another element to this is we have tax systems in Australia, in England, in Germany, in America that were designed 100 years ago for the industrial age. America has one of the best tax systems you could possibly design for 1950. <laughs> we don't live in that world anymore. The most valuable assets today are intangibles. It's the process to make um, uh, an English muffin that's absolutely identical everywhere in the world, regardless of the weather and the water and everything else, <coughs> to um, uh, create pharmaceuticals and software and other things. And those intangibles, we don't know how to tax properly. And companies like Google drive a wedge between intangibles and intangibles to make money. And yes, we need to have a fundamental debate about the nature of property <coughs> driven by cyberspace, uh, biological revolution that's coming, and these concepts of how do we avoid social disruption because we don't want to go back to a Hobbesian world, you know, of uh, uh, everyone at war with everyone else. This, uh, this 
what a paper blue should. I promised him a question earlier, so I got to stick to my promise. Okay, I've got a... He said it was going to be silly, let's see. Yeah, this, this will be silly, so I'll begin. You're the head of the corporation? I am. Yeah, good. You are not worth a thousand times your workers pay. Yep, yep. Uh, are you well, then? Right, right. Um, <laughs> so, would it not, could we not begin to restore some equality by saying, instead of legislating for minimum rates of pay, we'll to, maximum. to legislate for a maximum rate of pay, and not a maximum rate of pay as in no one's allowed to earn more than this many dollars a year, but yeah. rather a maximum rate of pay is, say, 10 times the minimum rate right. that the company pays. So this is an issue I've written about for many years. Um, uh, back in 1996, I was the lead writer on a series of the New York Times where we revealed all sorts of stuff nobody knew. We showed that the head of the Coca-Cola company had built a billion-dollar fortune on which he paid taxes on 2% of it. And the directors of the company didn't even know this. They had hidden it so well that they thought they approved X, and it was actually about 10 times X. And many contracts of executives in America, which are public record, uh, say that the, the policy of the company, that the executive will be paid in the upper quartile of similar executives. Well, boy, when did they start saying that to the secretaries and the janitors? And it's a real fundamental problem, and it's pure rent-seeking, a, a terrible term economists use to mean you're, you're gouging, you're price gouging. In every job in the world I know of, except CEO, the economic theory is we pay you just enough money if we want to keep you that you won't leave. If you're a CEO, it's how much can we pay you because of these back scratching arrangements. And the solution to that, it seems to me, is two things. Stop paying executives in options that are priced at the market. Because if the whole market goes up, your options automatically go up no matter what your performance is. And if you fund pensions for our retirement plans with mass purchases, like in America they're called 401k plans, you inherently bias the market upward because every week money is flowing in to buy stocks no matter what, and the price has to go up and the executives get richer. Um, I would pay executives in stock, and I would say when you leave the company, you can't sell it when you work there, you can't borrow against it, Collect the dividends, and when you leave, you can sell 10% when you leave, and then of the balance, 20% a year for the next five years, because you won't want to be so conservative that the company doesn't grow, and yet you don't want to be so aggressive that you don't think about the long-term wealth of the company. You don't want you don't want Jack Welch, who ruined General Electric and was hailed as this great genius 17 years since he left and the company stole mess. But he got a billion dollars. And the other way you deal with it is you tax it. You know, no, we'll go home and try my $10 million experiment. Just sit down and with a piece of paper and say, how much can I spend? You know, and you can think about ordering flowers. That's consuming. The flowers are going to die. See how much money you can spend. I do this with my students all the time. And there's no utility to society to pay somebody 20 or 30 or 50 or $100 million a year. Jack Welch will work just as hard for $50 million as he did for a billion because it's who he is. That's why he got that job. And so the solution to that is let's tax this away. In America, the top tax rate starts at $400,000. Donald Trump made $400,000 a day in 2015 and paid a 3.5% tax rate but for the backup tax. That's absurd. We should have a tax rate that starts with a million and two and a half million and five million and 10 million, and 50 million, and 100 million. You know that there are over 100 executives, 100 people a year in America whose salary is over 100 million dollars? Over 50 million dollars, I'm sorry, it's over 50 million dollars. 100 of them over, over 50 million dollars. That's absurd. And the answer to that is tax. Hey, I just want to ask you about, um, you know, the against like high taxation for uh, corporates is that um, in the new world world government where everywhere is taxed the same, like corporates, especially with capital and the more ability to move around, yeah. they can just go somewhere else and then it hurts economy in this particular country. And 
some are still like right now in Ireland and they refuse to collect tax on Google. And right. then also in the more, you know, supposedly fairer Scandinavian systems that the, the like labor is taxed much higher than corporates. And then so that's why I want to ask you so, what's your argument yeah. against that and what's your which country do you think has a best tax system? I don't think anybody has the best tax system right now. Yes. Nobody has, has done. One of the things that's in my new tax system that I've spent the, these 20 years developing and, uh, that I think is all worked out because I had a, a very knowledgeable expert who was unfamiliar with my work run me, I ran, ran through it and she passed me today. Um, but we'll see. Um, I would eliminate the corporate income tax. Here's the problem. If you get rid of the corporate income tax, you'll see corporation managers simply stuff profits into a, into a mattress. That's what Google's doing and what Apple's doing. Apple's got a quarter of a trillion dollars in liquid assets. Imagine if we had a rule, you either had to pay that to your workers, you had to pay it to your shareholders as a dividend, or you had to reinvest with the company, and you just tax away. You can have a certain amount of, of liquid assets, and above that, we tax it away. We actually have that rule in America for something called REITs, real estate investment trusts. And I would tax the income that comes from it. That is, what you really want to do is tax consumption and not wealth as much as you can. But you can't not tax wealth at some point. Um, it's one of the tricky issues that you'll see dealt with in, in my book, The Prosperity Tax. But I, I would get rid of the corporate income tax. It's, it's become a profit center for many companies. Enron literally stamped documents, profit center for the tax part. Uh, when I reported that there was a profit center on the front page of the New York Times, the American Congress undertook the biggest investigation that's ever been done on the Joint Committee on Taxation. It produced an 1,800 page, three volume study that they had subpoena power. I just had to go from the outside, backed up everything I said that it was a profit center. And other companies have now acknowledged that the income tax is a profit center. Corporations want the income tax. That's also we need to get rid of for them. But we have to replace it with other things if we want to get the benefits out of corporations. And then we need a steeply progressive income tax so that people can pay the necessities of life. Adam Smith said, if you tax the necessary, he called, you just raise the cost of goods without any beneficial Achievement and necessaries change over time. Um, you know, people need cell phones today if they want a job. It's just a reality. So you have to consider that unnecessary. You have to have a refrigerator these days because that's how we handle food. It's different than we used to be. You may not have to have a car, depends on where you live, but necessaries change. But you need to not tax the basic income people need to live, and above that, you can impose a graduated tax that's higher and higher on higher incomes. By the way, it's one of the things that I didn't talk about in this lecture, it's a different lecture that I gave, is the moral basis of that, how the Athenians worked it out, and how inventing the moral basis of progressive taxation was fundamental to the invention of democracy 2,500 years ago. They're completely defined, and that will all be in my book for prosperity tax. But what do you do with um, corporate owner, for example, like they may have a dollar of annually, like a salary, but then they stash all their Right, and I, what I would do is anything you take as consumption, you're going to pay taxes on now. No deferrals, you're fully taxed, and then when you die, we'll deal with your wealth. <laughs> Otherwise, okay. we don't have excessive concentration. Do you have any more? Um, a, a question How dangerous are the Koch brothers? <laughs> I don't think the Koch brothers are dangerous at all. Let me give you a different take on the Koch brothers. The Koch brothers' policies are absolutely inimical to human beings. <laughs> On the other hand, the Koch brothers are very good managers of their companies. They've tremendously grown the wealth of the family. They're voters, you know, and they want to have laws that allow them to make you pick up the costs of their pollution instead of cleaning up their own operations. But uh, when one of the companies the Koch brothers owns got into trouble, this hasn't been reported on before, as best I know, uh, one of the two Cook brothers who told his wife he wasn't going to go to work every day anymore, every day had his driver taken to this uh, uh, entity that was part of the Cook empire because he had put in place a manager who totally screwed it up. Everybody was going to, they were going to have to shut it down or, or sell it. And he felt it was his mistake and he had an obligation to the employees and he fixed it. 
And that, those are the things you want stewards to do. But the policies that they have and their belief that their money should buy what they want, that's the whole speech I give about ancient Athens. Uh, money should not have the role it has in democracy. And it is underlying all of these problems we're having in many ways are campaign finance. If any of you got elected to the Senate, the federal Senate, you would very quickly discover that you have to spend all your time kowtowing to whoever needs favors from the committee that you serve on, or you'll be out of office. We gotta break that system. We gotta break that system. We can break that system and still have democracy by publicly funding elections and requiring more disclosures. And if you're a good senator and people like you, I don't care if you serve 80 years, uh, but I don't want uh, you to be dependent on anybody except the goodwill of the voters in your jurisdiction. We'll pay you a bigger salary if we need you. By the way, did I really read that your, some of your ministers get a million dollars a year? No, no, no. no, no, no. That's, that's the request on the uh, oh. 600000 Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, There's a mic, so I hear one more after. Oh. Um, I just wanted to ask you, um, I heard a lot from a lot of people in the audience. Um, you mentioned about the labels, and you mentioned about non believing democracy. Um, let me put something to you. Uh, when I was, I'm 38 years of age, I grew up in actually one of the poorest parts of Sydney. It's called Mount Druitt. They made a movie about how poor we were. Um, when I was a kid growing up, the government, the Labor government, gave me or study at the age of 16. I was able to go to TAFE. I was able to get my diploma to TAFE. I'm sorry, I'll give just that because you're using some terms of English. The government, the government gave you the ability to get college education. And yes, because the government paid high welfare. Yeah, now, the yeah, welfare yeah. package that I was on right. is now only given to people over 25, right. and it's pretty much non-existent. When it comes to younger people, what we're upset at, and what they're upset at, is they're constantly seeing older people who care only about money. We can't own a home, we don't want to worry about that. They're only caring about money, and they're taking more and more and more away from from the youth. So what's the, what's, the what's the question? What's the question? So my question is, when you talk about democracy and you talk about young people not believing in it, that's because there's not well, what's just the a capitalist democracy. Have you, what about socialist democracy? Okay. All right, and my question is what about socialist democracy? Because the majority of young people around the planet want that and the majority yep. of young people when they, when you see their votes, for example in America, and in Australia, are both the moment we have to the left. I have a question. Okay, so first of all, it's only, I wonder if you know, it's only 24% of millennials. It's not all millennials that I was describing, but I found that to be a disturbing number, okay? Secondly, I understand your circumstances totally. I had to go to work at 10 and full time at 13, okay? So I've been 55 years, almost 56 now, full time. Hmm? Yeah, I'm sure a number of students. And I only have a college education because in California, college was free, and I'm technically a war orphan. My dad was 100% disabled veteran of World War II, so I got some money to go to school. Otherwise, I wouldn't have an education. Today, if I were in the same circumstances that I was in when I turned 18, I wouldn't have college education. I wouldn't have gotten where I've gotten. Well, maybe I would, because I'm perhaps very ambitious, but not for my peers. And this is a horrible policy that we've had. And we have not only had redistribution of income and wealth through, I wrote a whole series of books, the ones Donald Trump basically ran for office on, on all these subtle techniques that take from the many and redistribute to the few, that allow uh, companies in America like Walmart and Home Depot, which is a big hardware type chain, and General Electric to build their factories and offices, not with their own capital, but with taxpayer dollars. And then there's, there's no money from schools, except for football. <laughs> And so uh, I'm, I'm with you about this. We, we have, uh, but it is not just the older generation of people. The boomers that I'm in, the people older than the boomers, and just behind us, it's called the, act, the baby in America, we call them the baby, act, uh, not the baby, the baby bus. It is people at the very top who manipulated the system, because well, these folks are better off, they also get a wave of growth. Um, one of the problems with the word socialist is all sorts of people conflate it with communists. All the people do. A lot of other people do too. Trust me, I lecture colleges all the time. Uh, and 
Uh, they don't grasp that the idea of democratic socialism, as you see it in Europe, and Bernie Sanders proposes it, is that private interests will decide on the allocation of capital, but with rules that protect ordinary people from abuses and economic shocks over which they have no control. And the Europeans have really done pretty well with this. We have a better system and in Australia. I think we have a better system in California. Well, I wouldn't go back to California. That's how bad it's become. Yeah. And, and what you saw arise at the time of Reagan and Thatcher and some others was uh, something articulated first by Mrs. Thatcher, but also by Milton Friedman, the economist. You know, Margaret Thatcher used to say, we're not a society. We're 55 million people who share none. What a horrible sort of thing to say. Reagan said something very similar. Said, and, and no, we're societies, and we're social animals. And, and by the way, we're, we're social animals who follow leaders. We're mammals. Uh, we've got, we're getting the rules wrong. We need to get back to paying attention to getting the rules right. To recognize that uh, when those people who are motivated by greed, which is a sin, we want them to think, okay, we're going to change you. That's who you are. That's how you were born. We want to channel that in a way that benefits society. People who are motivated by beauty, well, we want to promote you being an artist or a novelist or a writer and figure out how good the society benefits from. We need to spend more time thinking about the rules and getting away from this idea that we don't have to have any rules and not investing in young people. Uh, well, besides the 35,000 to one story of the box, which I hope you keep with you and share with other people, there's very good research that shows that every dollar, at least in America, invested in a child from, this is somebody else's phrase, but I like this phrase, from erection to six months, <laughs> uh, pays a compound annual return of 7%. If you can get a guaranteed compound annual rate of return of 7% on something when you're young, just put your money in it when you're old, you'll be fine. We should be spending more money on young people, and we should be investing in the future. Instead, we are disinvesting in the future, and we will be poorer for that. You know, students who perform should be paid to go to school. Uh, graduate students who want to be biologists, and, and we shouldn't say to them, well, you can't be a lab rat and make 60000 a year for the rest of your life because it's going to cost you a quarter million dollars to get a doctorate, so you're qualified to be a lab rat. That's just crazy. We need to be investing in the future all the time. And the most valuable asset every society in the world has is the gray matter of children. And we need to make it rigorous, and we need to be banding about it, and we need to stop this notion of those who can't teach. And we need to say, you're the future. We are investing in you, and you're going to pay us back because you're going to do well in the future. We're going to have a stable society. We're going to have a prosperous society, and we're going to be free people because at the end of the day, the liberties of the people are what we most want to protect. David, just getting back on the track of corporations. Last one. Yep. Uh, everything up here that you tonight, and everything I've learned over the past few decades, wouldn't it be more beneficial and more sensible for society to rid itself of corporations? No, I don't think so. I think we can change corporations, but we have to have entities. And let me give you the historical thing I teach my students. In Hammurabi's time, if you were one to start business and didn't pay it back, you and your wife and your concubines, because you would have had them back then, and your children would be put into slavery for three years, which is sort of a proto-banking regulation in the university world. Because nobody loaned you more money than the labor they could get out of you after feeding you for three years. Um, corporations are simply vessels to do something efficiently. What we need to have are rules that control them. But when corporations began in America, they were for a limited term, usually 20 years, a single purpose. You know, now you can create a corporation. The purpose of this corporation is to make money. You're literally allowed to do that. And they can, they can last forever. And you had to prove to get a corporate charter that you provided something useful to society. And hiring people was an assumption that you had to hire people. That was not an argument. Today, it's only create jobs. What a nonsense argument. What are you doing better? We need to redefine these rules. But per se, having a shield of liability to encourage risk-taking and investment is a good thing. It's all the other rules around that that we need to rework 
to recognize that so we get what we want to do is get the benefits and the least possible damage. We don't want economic pollution, which is what we're getting now. Well, thank you. Thank you.